Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking you that, that, by expressing that it's a great pleasure to be introduced by, by Javier, who has also been one of my heroes and one of the, <laughs> one of the leaders and pioneers of modern, modern vet research in, in, in Iberia. Well, the Ghana has always been a reference for us, and Javier and Carlos have always been a reference for us in terms of research too. My second thank you is to the organizers of the conference uh, uh, for inviting, inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure to be, to be here uh, talking to an audience that is uh, a great example of a growing community of researchers in, in, on, on pets. Um, oh, I guess I need a control, yeah. <laughs> Minor detail. So the objectives of this talk, this talk has two main, main objectives. The first one is to give an overview of the current situation of uh, bat research and, and bat conservation in Portugal. And the second is to highlight the, to highlight the importance of, of uh, research for conservation. Uh, and I will do that by describing a series of projects in which we have been involved, which uh, were done to address issues, to address questions that are particularly important for the conservation of pets. And the ones that I will talk about today are for the conservation of cave-dwelling bats, which, as you know, are particularly important in Iberia because we not only have bats in caves during the winter, which happens throughout Europe, but we also have bats in caves during the summertime, nursing colonies. So we have additional problems in terms of conservation, which very often are different from those that people have in more northern, northern countries. So bat research and conservation in Portugal, well, um, I would like to say that we have had bat researchers since the 1500s, but we don't. But uh, we did have a pioneer, which in the late 1900s, Barbosa de, Barbosa de Bocage, and this was a, a, a brilliant taxonomist who uh, did a great job, especially in taxonomy, which was biology at the time, was almost only taxonomy, especially doing taxonomy of bats um, in Africa, in the former Portuguese, Portuguese colonies. This was a, a fantastic person who did a fantastic work, who went on including to be a minister of the government, and I know that that doesn't mean very much now, but at that time, not now, at that time, ministers were people, were outstanding members of the society, which because they were outstanding, were pulled into leadership positions of society. Nowadays we are um, down to a situation where the leaders of society are not outstanding people, they are just members of political poor political party sometimes. Well, anyway, so he was from the Escola Politecnica, which is where I got my, my undergrad degree, and the University of Lisbon also, which is where I work. Uh, oops. After, after him, there was a period during which we only had a few, very few papers about taxonomy, almost always, or all of them. And only in, the, in this graphic shows the the, the number of papers published by authors, not necessarily Portuguese, but with addresses in Portuguese institutions, um, how in, in published in the, in the, in, with impact factor journals. As, as, as you can see, we only really started publishing papers in impact factor journals about bats uh, in the mid-1990s, but then the number of papers uh, grew very much, uh, very quickly, and uh, we now publish in Portugal about 20 papers in the impact fact journals every, every, every year. Of course, this growth, this fast growth in the number of publications by Portuguese-based by scientists is not only due to an increase in the productivity, but also to the fact that people stop publishing in local journals and start publishing in international journals. But of course, also due to an increase in the number of people, in the number of institutions where people do bat research in the country. And from north to south, we have people working on bats. Uh, starting from the north to south, we have the University of Trás-os-Montes. There is a, just a small group of people that work with bats, mostly distribution work and, uh, and uh, basic biology work, but it is a, a group in the north. Then we have the, the, the University of Porto, which is a group that is led by Hugo Rubel, who most of you know, which, which is an excellent group that focus mostly on issues relating to uh, genetics and using molecular, molecular techniques, but who does a lot of work on several different ecology topics also. The University of Aveiro had a little bit of activity, but that was Maria João Ramos. She now left to Brazil, and she has been living in Brazil for a few years. So uh, 
I don't know if there is anyone who will continue working in Aveiro on beds. Then in the Azores, way out in the Azores, Azores, as, as probably some of you know, has two species, one of which is an endemic, Nitalus azoreum, which is an endemic of the Azores archipelago. And uh, the, some people, some researchers of the University of Azores have done some work on bats too. Uh, in Lisbon, um, we have a relatively large, large group that works on various topics, usually somehow related to conservation, although it includes various from molecular studies to, to, to real field ecology, but um, it's, it's a pretty diverse group. And we have always collaborated with the Institute of Nature Conservation, which is the, the official institute for conservation in the country, and where Luisa Rodrigues, who many of you will also know, uh, works, and she continues doing research, some research, particularly um, uh, reviews that are particularly important for the decision-making process within the Institute and within European institutions that are somehow related to uh, conservation. Um, then the University of Evora, where there is a, a, a group led by Antoni Mir, and there are a couple, of, a couple of Portuguese people from the University of Evora here, that does work on different topics, mostly ecology. They have done some excellent work on the impact of roads on pets and on the mortality caused by, 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 by cars on, on bats, but they're also working on other issues, habitat use and so on. And finally, the University of Madeira, which is a little bit like the University of Azores. Madeira has several bat species. And the University of Madeira has a couple of researchers who have also worked, done some work, some work with bats. So basically, from north to south, from the mainland to the islands, there are now people doing research with work, and some of them doing excellent research with bats. Uh, what about bat conservation? Well, the two things have been closely linked from the, the beginning of this last phase of work with bats. So in the 19, uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, we, um, together at the University of Lisbon and the Institute of Nature Conservation, decided to carry out, uh, to, to make a, a national cave bat conservation plan. And this was probably the first national cave, you know, the first national uh, conservation plan uh, in Europe, or at least one of the first. And, uh, and this plan laid out um, basically the priorities for conservation, listed all the, 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 important, the most important issues, the most important threats. Uh, it listed the, 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 priorities, the priorities in terms of, uh, of research. And basically, a lot of what we have done since then has been to implement those priorities that were already laid out in this National Cave Bed Conservation Plan. Well, one of the recommendations of the Cave Bed Conservation Plan was that we would start a, long uh, a monitoring program of the populations of Portuguese cave dwelling bats. And this is still going on, so you know, ever since the uh, early 1990s, uh, every year, the most important uh, roosts of cave dwelling bats are visited twice, once during the nursery se nursing season and once during the wintering season. So we have a very long data set of monitoring populations of cave dwelling bats. Um, well, of course, part of conservation is public education. And at first, public education was just basically us researchers, you know, doing a little bit of public education. But it's far from that now. There are many activities, many initiatives um, on public, uh, on cons you know, public education about bats. The most important of which is probably um, a center that was established by FCT. FCT is the foundation that funds all the research in Portugal. But they not only fund research but they also fund education about science. And they set out, they established and built a center for, that is mostly focused on, on bats, in bat biology and bat conservation. So they have a permanent exhibit, a permanent interactive exhibit. And they also organize, because it's, it's located close to a large roost, a roost with a large colony of uh, myotis, myotis, and minioptérios. They have observation points where people can watch the emergency of bats. They have um, a system to watch in real time, to watch the colony inside the caves using um, infrared video. So it's a very nice, it's a very nice center. And uh, not only they have this permanent center, but they also have a mobile interactive, interactive exhibition, which they lend to schools. 
So it basically goes around from school to school, spreading the word about how good bats, bats can be. Um, legal protection. Well, bats have been protected in Portugal, actually, since way before Portugal joined the European, European Union. Um, but the establishment of Natura 2000 Network was a great opportunity to transfer to the terrain, to the, to the, to the ground, many, or much of the knowledge that we have about the distribution of Portuguese bats and about the location of important routes. And this has been done. So uh, at the time when the sites were selected, bats were relevant in the selection of the sites for Natura 2000, which does not mean that all the sites that we would like to have included became Natura 2000 but quite a few of them did. So it was thanks to the fact that we had quite a bit of information and that we had that information organized that we were able to use it and to use it as input for the decision-making process in the classification of the sites. Um, well, legal protection is not enough because naturally it's not possible to, to have a policeman in front of every single uh, important roost. So many of the roosts that uh, were subjected, they were important that they were subjective to disturbance, uh, have been protected with, uh, with fences to minimize human disturbance of the underground colonies. Um, the recognition of the importance and the relevance of bats um, made bats um, a regular uh, concern of uh, people making impact assessment studies and um, made, you know, the, the the, the constructors um, forced them to start taking into consideration the impact on bats and come up with alternative compensatory measures. And on the left, we have uh, a building that was built to, as a compensatory measure for the destruction of a former building which, was, which had a bat colony, and they were forced to build this alternative. On the right, we have um, a, a, an artificial cave, you know, a gallery which was built as a replacement for, for a similar gallery that was flooded by, by, a, by a, a dam. So, you know, they are accepting the fact that bats are not disposable animals. They're actually animals that they have to take into consideration uh, in, their, in, their, in their projects. And the status of bats is, of some of bats, of all bats was, was evaluated in 2005, last time, but after that, there was there was a, a great growth of of uh, knowledge about about bats in the country, and uh, which was mostly in what concerns distribution, uh, condensated in the atlas uh, of the distribution of uh, mainland Portugal bats, which was organized by by Anarim. and using this information and information and more information that meanwhile has arrived. We are about to start a new project where we will do research to reevaluate the status of all the mammals in Portugal, and that will include naturally the bats. So we are hoping that next year we will start doing research to be able to um, to reevaluate um, the, all the bats, taking into consideration the status that we had in 2005 and all the information that meanwhile we have we have collected. So. In summary, I would say that the situation of bat conservation in Portugal is not nearly as good as, as we would like it to be, but it's certainly not worse off than the conservation of most other groups of vertebrates. And that's already a plus, because uh, when we started out, bats were certainly looked as second-class citizens in, uh, in, in nature. But of course, there's still a lot to do. Well, so with this, we pass to the, the, to the second, second part of this conversation, which is research challenges for the conservation of, of cave-dwelling bats. And this is not very recent work. Uh, in fact, our group at the University of Lisbon has shifted mostly to the tropics, and um, um, a lot of the work that, that, that has been done by several researchers of the University of Lisbon or people with whom we collaborate has been either presented here or is reflected in the posters. But what I will talk about today is all the research that was done specifically on the conservation of cave-dwelling bats. And that work involved many researchers, but particularly Luis Rodrigues, Ana Reinho, and Andres Zan. Well, biodiversity crisis and opportunity. Well, biodiversity is declining at unprecedented rates. We all know that. 
it's it's not as much true in Europe as it is in the tropical regions. I mean, uh, thankfully, Europe has passed the phase of most of the decline, and actually, in certain areas, we are recovering, and nature is is coming back, and and uh, many species are are improving their conservation status, including possibly possibly with bats. But throughout the world, and sometimes in Europe too, nature is declining. But this decline. Uh, has been accompanied by many new opportunities, opportunities that in the past simply did not exist. In the past, we mostly uh, had to accept the, the decline, complain about it, and very often we could do very little about it. Well, nowadays, there was a great increase in opportunities for conservation. One of those great opportunities in Europe, for example, is Natura 2000. Natura 2000, despite all the, the, the shortcomings of the implementation of the process, was a revolution in terms of nature conservation in Europe. I mean, it forced Europe to rethink the strategy of conservation, and it created a network that it is a, a, a real network in spite of shortcomings, and it commits the states, for example, to do things like periodically evaluate the performance of the system. And this is magic, I mean, because, because very often um, systems conservation uh, initiatives take place, but nobody evaluates. Well, this one we are forced to evaluate. Well, we are forced to evaluate, but there is nobody to enforcing enforcing seriously the, the the obligation to do the evaluation. So this process is is a very has been a very slow process, but um, it's getting better. Countries are starting to be concerned with the risk of fines from the European Union because they don't properly implement Natura 2000. So Natura 2000 is a great opportunity for conservation and also for funding conservation, because very often the European Union, for example, puts out money that, is, that has to be, for example, the life projects that has to be applied in the Natura 2000 site. So this is, these are opportunities that were created by the existence of Natura 2000. Rural development funds, for example, that also the European uh, Union puts out with the objective of improving the rural landscape, and as we know, most of our wildlife is now dependent on on rural landscapes and many private funding initiatives. I mean, nowadays you can go to the internet and look for opportunities for funding for projects of threatened species, and there are opportunities. Uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there were far fewer opportunities that we have now. So even though we have a major crisis, we have major opportunities also, and it's necessary, and it's a challenge for conservationists to take advantage of these opportunities to transform them in real, in real, in real conservation. Well, but anyone that has been involved, um, that has been trying to do conservation, um, stumbles on the lack of proper information. And very often, us, we scientists, uh, have not studied the, the, the some very important issues, and very often we have a very hard time uh, giving advice on, our, on the species that, or habitats of which we are experts simply because we don't have the information. So quite a few times, um, well-intentioned people have contacted me and said, George, what shall I do about this? And I go like, I don't know, what's best? I don't know, what's best for this species? Well, yeah, maybe this is better, but I'm not sure. And if you do this, maybe you'll affect that, sh that species, but I'm not sure. So there's clearly um, a lack of information to be able to give advice, to be able to lead conservation. And so it is important that we make uh, research to fill this gap of knowledge so that we can uh, start making uh, conservation uh, be based more and more on scientific facts, on scientific advice. <laughs> Didn't like what I said. <laughs> okay, objectives. Well, um, so in, this, in, the, in the remaining of this talk, what I will be doing is to outline a series of questions that are very important in terms of conservation that need to be, to, be, to be answered in order for us to optimize the conservation of large colonies of cave-dwelling bats. So I'm not talking about all bats. I'm concentrating on cave-dwelling bats. And I will do that uh, describing a series of projects that we have done um, with this objective. And I basically will go from question to question, and, and I'll go through six different questions that we need answers for in terms of uh, conservation. So what do we need to know to preserve bats? And here I'm talking about cave-dwelling bats. 
Well, bats, we know, cave-dwelling bats form colonies, very, sometimes very large colonies, and concentrated in a relatively small number of roosts. Therefore, the conservation of these roosts is essential for the conservation of the, the, the species. So we need to know how to protect bat roosts. But of course, protecting best bat roosts is not enough to guarantee the survival of a colony, because we, of course, uh, bats are dependent on uh, uh, um, foraging habitats, and more, they usually dependent on the possibility of easily getting food, so they are very often dependent on high quality habitats. So we have to be able to know how to manage bat foraging areas so that we maintain those high quality habitats which allow the survival, the survival of species. So uh, basically, these are the two main questions that, that, uh, that uh, we need answers for. But I will go on through six sub-questions that are integrated in, in the framework of these two main questions. So, Starting with the simple ones, which roosts should we protect? Um, oops. Well, and for, to answer this question, I'll talk about studies that were done mostly by Luis Rodrigues on Minioptérus, Minioptérus rabesi, which, as you know, it's a cave-dwelling species that tends to form very large colonies. We have colonies, we have one colony, one nursing colony with about 20,000 bats, which is a very large colony for us, nothing like in the Americas where they have millions. <laughs> we cannot talk about millions, but 20,000 is a lot in Europe. Um, and it is a species that makes, that cannot um, find its uh, environmental requirements, environmental roosting requirements in one particular cave. So very often they have to move from cave to cave uh, in the, to meet, in the, to, to find the conditions appropriate for each season. So they have to make these regional, relatively small, small by small mean dozens or hundreds of few dozen, a hundred, time, a hundred kilometers, but they have to make migrations. So the first step of this process was to, to make a, an intensive survey in which we located all the main, the most important roosts for the species. And at first it may seem like, okay, you already have the information, you just select the most important of these roosts and you protect those, and you will have protected what is important to protect in terms of roosts for these species. But that's, of course, not true, because the fact that my, my Minioptus hybersi is a migratory species. So if you protect uh, an individual roost that's insufficient to protect a colony of a migratory species, you must protect not only the roost where it, where it breeds, but also the network of roosts that are used by the species throughout the yearly cycle. Only then you can guarantee that uh, the species survives, of course, if all the other conditions for the survival of species are met. So to be able to learn what are these connections between roosts, these, these interdependencies between roosts, we carried out, uh, we studied migration using a ringing study, and we put rings on about probably 30,000, 40,000 Minioptera schreibers. And uh, thanks to this very intensive effort, we were able to map the main mig migratory movements of the species and um, identify the network of caves of which uh, each nursery is dependent to be able to, 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 to survive. So for example, there's a nursery here that's the a very large nursery, the one that I told you about that's the biggest nursery. And the bats in this nursery uh, over the early cycle also use these roosts and so to be able to guarantee the survival of that particular nursery, we have to be able to, we have to protect, we now know that we have to protect four roosts, not, not just one. So we already know that uh, which roosts we can, we can protect. So how can we protect them? Um, how can we physically protect the roosts that, need, that, are, that are so important? Well, the main threat to roosts, as we all know, to underground roosts tends to be disturbance due to excessive visitation. So what's the solution? Well, the solution has been to block access of visitors. And uh, usually this has been done, traditionally this has been done by grilling the entrance of the cave. And this is probably the best way to stop people from going into a cave. And it is a technique that has been used widely in Central and Northern Europe where bat conservation actually started. And it works very well there. But it works very well there, but 
it's natural to ask, will it work in the South? And why the difference? Well, in Central and Northern Europe, bats do not uh, form summer colonies, do not form nurseries inside caves because the caves are simply too cold. So they only lose, they use caves mostly to hibernate. So if a bat is hibernating, it does not frequently have to cross the gate. So in Central Europe, where bats seldom leave the caves, where the movement across the entrances of caves is relatively minimal, uh, these gates work very well. But in Southern Europe, where they also breathe in the caves and they have to get in and out, get in and out several times a night, it may not work. And we, to be able to check, to check that, what we did was we set up um, a, a few uh, temporary, temporary gates and we filmed the behavior of bats with using infrared video uh, coming in and out of the of these roosts through these uh, temporary, temporary gates. And the conclusions that we got were uh, very surprising and to a great extent worrisome. <clears throat> well, the gates induce the bats to abandon very often. The gates induce the bats to abandon the roosts. And the gates changed the flight behavior of the bats when they were crossing, when they were going in and going out of the roosts in ways that could increase the risk of predation for bats. Because as you know, bats are not really adapted to a high predation. Uh, to high predation, bats have a very slow reproductive um, system, and they can't take much predation. But there is one moment during which bats are quite exposed to predation. And that's when they're going out or when they're going in their roost. Inside the caves, relatively few, some, but relatively few predators can catch them. Uh, out when they're catching, when they when they're ant hunting outside, a relatively few predators can catch them. But in that moment, when they're coming in and out of the roost, they have to move through a relatively small space, and some predators learn about it, and some predators concentrate there and catch them. So anything that makes them more vulnerable in this passage increases the chances of them to die. And we found that bats flew a lot slower if they have a gate. So if they don't have a gate, they fly much quicker uh, into, the, into or out of the cave. They, because they have that obstacle, they tend to slow down a lot. They flew lower. And of course, if they, they fly lower, they become more accessible to predators like cats. Uh, they tend to make circular flights near the entrance, maybe to check it, make sure that they, in, everything is fine, and then they go in. And these circular flights increase the opportunities for terrestrial predators to catch them. And they sometimes landed near the entrance. So this was something that happens uh, even in, in, in entrances without, without gates, but became more common when we have gates. Bats hang around the entrance, you know, stay there for a little while, and then go in. And that is danger, I mean, because quite often next to the, these entrances you have cats, or you have uh, um, foxes, uh, you have snakes, so you have lots of predators that, that, can, that can take them. So basically, these gates can be pretty nasty. And uh, uh, the conclusion was that the gates should not be used in the south to protect nursing colonies. And we now use fences. And this has become, and I saw that in, in a few of the talks uh, today in, in, or yesterday, has become a, a general recommendation. So people now know that in the south, uh, this is not to be done. But this was thanks to the work of, mostly thanks to the work of Louisa that uh, we know that now. Well, so what are the main, what have we learned about the protections of roots of Minyopteris hybersi? Well, we were able to map the network of roosts of which each colony is dependent. So we, now we know what is the network that we have to protect to warrant this, to guarantee the survival of a particular nursery. Um, we have identified which roosts should be protected based on on the, 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 the information that we obtain. And we have determined that these roosts should be protected with fences rather than, than, than with gates. Well, that's, so that's what we learned with the research done on miniopters, focusing on the issues of the conservation of their, their roosts. Well, but what else do we need to know how to preserve bats? Well, it doesn't matter how well we protect the bats inside the roost. It doesn't matter how well we protect the, the roosts of bats. If they don't have adequate, managing, uh, adequate foraging areas, they will not survive. So we have to ma learn how to properly manage foraging areas. And this is actually a lot more challenging, a lot more difficult than the conservation 
the conservation of, uh, of roosts. And for this, I will talk mostly about uh, studies that were done with myotis myotis and that were done mostly by, by, by Henri. Well, and uh, the first question on managing um, for aging areas is what is the radius around the colony used by, by bats? Well, we need to know how far they go while foraging in order to know what is the area that we must manage, that where we must guarantee the preservation of good foraging, foraging habitats. And to answer that, we did a, a large radio tracking study where we placed radios on the back of, uh, of bats, and then the, the, the bats were tracked um, to small, well, bef before GPS, small GPS tags were available, and actually even the current GPS tags tend to be too, too, too large to be able to apply on, on small bats. So this had to be done with conventional um, telemetry, which, is, which was a great, a great challenge. So a number of bats were, were tracked, and thanks to the tracking, uh, which was done for, of bats that departed from here, so this was the location of the, the roost. This is a very important roost in Portugal. It's, a, it's an abandoned mine, but an extremely important roost. And the colors, the patches in colors that you see, are the foraging areas of uh, these animals. And in, in green, we have the females. And in yellow, we have the, the foraging areas of males. Well, so um, using that information, we build this graphic where you can see the, 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 the foraging areas used by different individuals. And in light blue, you have the males. And in dark blue, you have females. And what you can see is that usually the males don't go as far as the, the, as, as the females. Um, but in any case, we have animals that were foraging, had foraging areas at more than 12 kilometers from the roost. So this is quite a large area, if you consider uh, to, to be able to, to preserve. So, but you know, we, we, the fact is that many of them go leave the colony and go straight to a feeding spot, which may be 12 kilometers or more from the roost. So this gives us an idea of uh, the, 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 the distance and the, the radius of the areas that we have to worry about. Of course, this is not going to be the same in all roosts. I mean, it, and it certainly will vary geographically, even within the same, the same uh, uh, biogeographical zone. But it's likely to be quite different if we go to latitudes with a very different climate. Well, the next question is, what are the habitats that bats use? And we need to know these in order to determine which habitats we want to protect, we want to promote, and we want to, to, to manage. So it's not enough, of course, to know what's the radius that, we, that bats use, but it's also important to know within that radius which habitats the bats are using. So we use the same data, and we overlaid the foraging areas of Myotis Myotis to a map of habitats of the study area, and this was the result. So what we, we have here is a selectivity index. So we have um, the selectivity index, which are the bars that represent the selectivity index. And here we have the main uh, habitats present in the, in the area. And unsurprisingly, bats clearly used very little areas with, with shrub. Remember that myotis myotis is a species that mostly catches their prey on the ground. So they don't get along very well with shrub. They can't really forage uh, under shrubs. And um, the the best habitats seem to be oak woodlands. We are talking here about montados, the hesas, and in particular, open oak woodlands. So they use quite a bit olive groves, probably not those intensive olive groves that we have now, but the traditional, these were the traditional olive groves, um, oak woodlands, and particularly open oak woodlands, and a little bit of open fields. So we now, um, so we know what are the the, the major habitats used by the species. But as I said, myotis myotis forages mostly on the ground. So it's important to look at what is the potential, import, the potential influence of ground vegetation on the foraging by the myotis myotis. And so we get to our fifth question. Does ground vegetation influence habitat suitability? Well, 
ground vegetation may influence how, how, um, habitat suitability in at least two ways. One is by influencing the abundance of prey, and the other one is by influencing the accessibility to prey. Because if the ground vegetation is very dense, then maybe even if there are many prey there, myotis, myotis cannot, cannot reach them and catch them. So the, we, to, to attempt to answer to the first question, we looked at how we sampled uh, ground vegetation and, and the abundance of prey in many points in all those habitats heavily used by myotis, myotis in the study area. And as we can see, uh, we have ground cover here, we have prey abundance, clearly, and each line represents one habitat, clearly in all habitats there was a tendency for the, 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 the abundance of <laughs> potential prey to increase with ground cover. So we concluded that in all habitats, more ground vegetation means greater prey abundance. But then, okay, does that mean that more ground vegetation is better? Well, maybe not, because as I said, dense ground vegetation may hinder the access of bats to those hyperabundance prey. So we had to look at the influence of a ground vegetation cover on the accessibility of prey. And to do this, Anna made a series of experiments, in controlled experiments in laboratory conditions, where she placed uh, trays with uh, ground vegetation with different, with different densities, and placed crickets, um, which are common prey for myotis myotis, and placed crickets inside, in, inside those trays. And then, and so she had three treatments, sparse ground vegetation, medium ground vegetation, and dense ground vegetation. And filming the bats and watching the, 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 the behavior of the bats in those films, um, it was possible to conclude that when the vegetation is sparse, in 1.2 minutes on the average, bats captured, cap were able to capture the, the, the cricket. <coughs> capture success, 100%. So they're always able to capture the, the cricket if the vegetation was sparse. In medium ground vegetation, the time to capture went up to five minutes, and the capture success went down to 90%. So a lot more time to catch each cricket, and they were not able to catch all the crickets. When the vegetation was even denser, well, the time to capture was went up to, to, up to, to on the average, to 12 minutes, and the capture success down to 40%. And basically what happens is that sometimes the bats can even, you know, Kept locate the, the cricket and they attack it, but then they get stuck on the vegetation. <laughs> they get like with wings uh, <laughs> stretching them out, but they can't reach the cricket. So, um, there's a clear effect of the vegetation on the accessibility to prey. So, does ground vegetation cover decreases access to prey? Yes, it does. So, where do the bats prefer to forage? They prefer to forage in areas with more prey or in areas where prey are more accessible, with less prey, but where prey are more accessible? Well, uh, the answer is they prefer less prey, but in, more, in areas where they are more accessible, where the habitat <laughs> makes the prey more easily accessible. And how do we know this? Because using radio tracking locations, uh, we found that the number of locations where the bats forage was greater in the areas that had more open, more sparse, ground vegetation. So they clearly are avoiding those areas richer in prey, but um, where the prey are just too difficult to catch. So we now know this, that what is the best, best foraging habitat, we know, but, but when should be, should, the next question should be, okay, so does that mean that we should try to optimize, to manage the area, to optimize the availability of this optimal foraging habitat? Well, it depends. And it depends on what? Of course, it depends if food is or is not limiting to the bat. Because bat populations can be limited by food or can be limited by other factors. And it only makes sense, it's only important to manage foraging habitat if the, the limiting factor is food. So we had to find out if food resources were limiting for the myotis, myotis or not. And this was a little bit of a challenge. Um, so to basically, we wanted to determine if there are any food bottlenecks that we want to, to minimize by managing foraging habitats. 
And to be able to answer this question, we studied the variation in body conditions, in weight, in body conditions of myotis, myotis, both in Portugal and in Germany. So we looked at how weight of the bats vary along the year. Well, we know, we all know that the body condition of bats varies throughout the yearly cycle. But the question is whether that variation is simply an intrinsic rhythm of changes of the weight of the animal to adjust to the, to the season, or if the variations in weight, the variations in body conditions, are a, a consequence of environmental constraints. So, if the, by comparing two regions with very different climates, uh, we can learn if it is likely that we have those environmental constraints or not. So if periods of low condition are not the same, in, the, in this case, in the two study areas, in the two countries, then it probably means that the, 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 the periods of low body condition are a consequence of resource bottlenecks, which are not the same for the two, for the two countries. So what were the conclusions that we got from this study? Well, what you have here is the variation of the weight, so of the body condition, of the bats um, in, in Germany, in orange, and in Portugal, in green. And so bats basically leave hibernation here. In Portugal, they leave hibernation much earlier than they do in Germany. And after you know, coming out of hibernation, they drop their condition a little bit, their body condition a little bit. And this happened in both countries. And then they start feeding springtime, plenty of food, and they gain weight very quickly. And that happens both in Portugal and in Germany. And then after this spring period, there is a drop in body condition. But this drop is more accentuated, much more accentuated in Portugal than it is in Germany. So the body condition during the summertime in Portugal, in southern Portugal, is almost as bad as the body condition that the animals have when they come out of hibernation. So, could this be the result of a food bottleneck that is present in Portugal and is not present in Germany? Well, to know that, we have to look at the availability of prey. So, uh, we sampled the availability of, uh, of, uh, of prey, of myotis, myotis in Portugal throughout the yearly cycle, and these are the results. And what you can see is that in, in the spring, there is a peak of abundance of the the diet the items, the insects that are usually um, preyed by, by myotis, myotis. Then during the summertime, there's a low of food, of food abundance, and then food abundance increases again towards the autumn. This is not a big surprise, considering that in southern Portugal, like in southern Iberia in general, the summer is a tough time in terms of availability of water. Plants dry up, so green biomass tends, tends to be very low. So the conclusion here is that probably because of that, the, the, there's a, a very low availability of food during the summertime, and that means that the periods of low body condition in Portuguese bats during the summer are coincident with periods, periods of very low food availability. So we concluded that summer is very likely to be um, a bottleneck for myotis myotis in, in, in Iberia. So, wrapping up the the results studying the, the, the issues relating to foraging of myotis myotis. We have that habitat should be managed in a radio of at least 10 kilometers around the, 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 the colony. This should be the advice that I would be giving if people would ask me about, you know, we have a big, large colony of myotis myotis, how shall we manage? I would say, well, be concerned about what happens in the radius of at least 10 kilometers, if possible more. Um, Bats management should favor their preferred habitats, and this is core coat woodlands, particularly open core coat woodlands. And I would also say that they should promote land uses that increase the availability of crickets and carabid beetles during the summertime. I don't know what these are. I'm no insect expert, but that's what I would advise them to do. Please try to um, promote, find out and promote um, uh, land uses that increased availability of food at a time that we know is a bottleneck for the populations of myotis, myotis in that region, at times that we know are challenging for the survival of myotis, myotis at, at that time. During the summertime, we find some myotis, myotis in really pitiful body conditions. Sometimes you can see that those animals are, are going through tough times. 
and we would promote grazing to keep areas with low ground covering. So now, we, now that we know that very dense ground vegetation is not good for, for myotis myotis, that they actually prefer to forage in areas with less dense vegetation, even if the availability, the, the, the abundance of prey is lower there, um, I would also advise them to promote grazing to keep areas um, with relatively low ground vegetation. Not too much grazing, because if you don't have green biomass, you're not likely to have insects, but to, 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 do, to somehow control the growth of ground vegetation, and grazing seems to be the intelligent way to do it, usually. So, thanks to, to this, to this uh, accumulation of, uh, of results, uh, it was possible to make a spatially explicit model to select areas around that particular colony, uh, where we feel that those measures should be, should, be, should be implemented. So this is actually an Natura 2000 area. So it is an area where sooner or later we will be able to give advice and they will listen to us in terms of what they should be doing to manage the habitat to protect the important species in the area. So um, I would say that we are now reaching a point in which we feel quite confident about what to recommend in terms of managing the habitats for Myotis myotis, of course, in Mediterranean regions, because we know that the reality of myotis myotis elsewhere in Europe is completely different. So, um, wrapping up and making some final comments about about uh, about uh, research driven by conservation, research pulled by conservation. Um, I hope that th this talk was a reminder of how much science we need to make management decisions, how much science we need to um, actually be able to give advice about, about conservation. Well, we did a lot, and many very important issues have simply not been studied. I mean, just, just, there's just no information at all about many important questions. Sometimes there's information about myotis myotis or miniopters, but we don't have that same type and same level of information about many other species. And because bat biology is so diverse, uh, very often we, we cannot extrapolate what the results that we have with one species to other species. So we need to have this information about all species or all ecological groups of species to be able to give proper advice to, to, to managers. Sometimes the information exists, it has been published, but it has not been translated into objective into clear uh, conservation, conservation measures. Th this is the type where the situations where we do the research, we publish the result, we publish the result um, addressing issues that are important and knowledge that's important about the biology of the species, but we do not think about, okay, how is this relevant for conservation? How would this type of knowledge change the way bad conservation should be done? Very often we don't do that. And sometimes I've talked to people that say, well, I mean, I'm not a manager, I am a researcher studying bat biology, and my, 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 my objective is to publish good work, and it's out there available for managers to be able to read it, interpret it, and do conservation based on scientific knowledge. So I would say, who should make this conservation? I would say it's, we should not expect managers to make these decisions, or better, we should not ma expect managers to dig in the scientific literature, to interpret it, and to be able to convert the knowledge into um, decisions. Very often, they simply don't have time or don't have knowledge to do that. So it's, up, it's our obligation, in my opinion, to, to make that extra effort to write that last section in the papers, which is usually entitled Relevance for Conservation. And, he, and there we should really think um, clearly about what type, what, how does our, the information that we just gained in that project can help, can influence bat conservation. And we should be very explicit about it. Ideally, we should write, I recommend this and that and that and that and that and that. And many people would say, well, I mean, we cannot never be sure, yes, we can never be sure. But, um, Certainly not doing anything is better than doing the best that we can do with existing knowledge. 
So what we should do is try to give the best possible advice based on the results that we that we we obtain. You know, fear of failing is is something that we need to overcome if we want our results to be to be used. And of course, uh, if we want to to guarantee that bats are optimally protected, that means protected to the level that is possible with the current, with the best scientific knowledge that is that is available. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado.